Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul Smith, a professor from practice at Georgetown Law in Washington, and I'm happy to welcome you to this uh, timely webinar entitled The Supreme Court and the Future of Affirmative Action. Sponsored by the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, this panel is one of many in a series of rapid response webinars. We're actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please visit AmericanBar.org slash CRSJ for updates. During today's program, some logistics are here. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not the chat function. If you don't see the, the Q&A, just make sure your screen is not idle. Uh, we will address questions at the end of the program, time permitting, uh, and we'll be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who has registered. Uh, so that you can share it widely with your network. So look forward to that. And with that, let me introduce um, the panelists for this great panel. Uh, they are Johannes Cleary, a partner at Paul Weiss in New York, Michael Lawson, president and CEO of the Los Angeles Urban League, Drusilla Ramey, uh, the Dean Emerita of Golden Gate University School of Law in San Francisco, and a former executive director, both of the Bar Association of San Francisco and of the National Association of Women Judges. John C. Yang, President and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, or AAJC. So it's a great group, lots of expertise here. Uh, with those introductions out of the way, let me just start with a little bit of history. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court has been wrestling with the constitutionality of affirmative action a uh, consideration of race in college and university admissions for many decades. As far back as the Bakke case in 1978, it has been consistent though in, in how it has addressed the issue. It has said over and over again that uh, race may be one factor in an individualized holistic assessment of each applicant. This was the famous compromise that Justice Powell worked out in 1978 in his concurrence in Bakke and has stood the test of time. Um, the court has stuck with that view um, because it, had, it concluded that diversity, including racial diversity, um, is something that's important to satisfy the educational function that each college and university is trying to, to do. Uh, and it, it has reaffirmed that position, the Supreme Court, several times, at first around 2003 in the Grutter versus University of Michigan case, uh, and then in two more recent decisions in, involving uh, the challenges by one Abigail Fisher against the admissions processes at the University of Texas, Fisher one and Fisher two. Now with a new grant of, of cert, uh, the, the issue has returned to the Supreme Court in two cases, one against Harvard and one against the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. The plaintiffs uh, in those cases asked the court to change course after more than four decades and rule that it is illegal to consider the race of applicants in the admissions process. The UNC case uh, is based on the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, while the Harvard case is based on Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but that statute has been interpreted as duplicating equal protection standards. So the distinction between a public university subject to the constitution and a private university subject to the statute may not make any difference in the outcome. I think it's fair to say that there will be a great, there's a great deal of concern among supporters of affirmative action that the now very conservative Supreme Court is, is ready, right, ready to mandate race blind admissions in both of these cases. Uh, but with that, let's start the discussion. Let's start with uh, you, uh, Drew. Uh, as a former dean of a law school, as a former executive of a uh, major metropolitan bar association, um, tell us what's at stake both for legal education and for the legal profession in these affirmative action cases. Well, in my view, What's at stake here is really nothing less than the perception and the reality of fair and equal justice in our extremely diverse nation. And I'm afraid that whatever hard won racial advances in higher education and in the professions uh, which it feeds uh, that we've achieved in the past 50 years or so may well be erased for both current and future generations. 
The fact is that even with the significant advances uh, that have been made in admissions due to uh, individualized holistic uh, uh, admissions, uh, inclusive of race, the legal profession nevertheless still stands at 86% white as the most segregated of the major professions with large firm equity partnerships where, as we know that real money and power is still standing at 92% white. <laughs> And the Supreme Courts of nearly half the states in our nation have not a single justice of color. Now, deans know that law school <clears throat> admissions, the pipeline to the profession and to politics and so many other things are really very far from a racially level playing field, but rather reflective of a train of historical privilege that most people of color have been and still are rarely positioned to board. LSAT scores to take one, for example, have long been shown to bear little correlation with ultimate law school success and with success in the professions, strongly correlating instead with nothing so much as socioeconomic and demographic status and access to resources. And as to the grade point average, also heavily weighted in admissions, of course, the GPAs from the most prestigious private and some public institutions reflect an enormous legacy preference, constituting as Al Franken back in his uh, comedian days has put it, an affirmative action program for one of the most privileged groups in the country, the sons and daughters of people like me. At most Ivy League schools, for example, between 35 and 40 some odd percent of these overwhelmingly white affluent legacy kids who apply are admitted despite their substantially lower average stats versus say 4% of everybody else. And that is, I assume, the main reason why Amherst College, one of the most prominent colleges in this country has moved to end this enormous preference. This decidedly unmeritocratic system is compounded in many fancy schools by breathtaking great inflation. When I graduated from Harvard, for example, 87% of the men and 91% of the women graduated with honors, which means when you graduate with Harvard, you're in the upper 90% of your class. And these inflated grades from prestigious schools are then often weighted far more heavily by leading graduate schools than the non-inflated grades achieved everywhere else. In the face of all this, undergraduate and graduate schools have employed affirmative action, which has in some measure ameliorated the impact of mechanisms that have worked historically to exclude most people of color from the legal profession and then from the judiciary. The impact of the elimination of affirmative action by the Supreme Court would be devastating as there are no real proxies for race. As Mr. Lawson will discuss, discuss in more detail following the passage of California's draconian anti-affirmative action initiative in 1996, the number of blacks in the incoming class at Berkeley Law declined by 1999 from 74 to 17, and Mexican-American admissions declined from 89 to 32. And in the Harvard case, it has been uh, entered into evidence that if affirmative action were eliminated, there would be a 50% decrease over four years, about 1,100 students in the number of black and Latinx students with Southeast Asian admissions also being badly affected. So let me just close uh, by uh, some words, not of a critical legal uh, studies, uh, racial studies scholar, but really of Justice Harry Blackman, himself a Republican. And he said in the Bakke decision, in order to get beyond racism, we must first take account of race. There is no other way, we cannot, we dare not let the Equal Protection Clause perpetuate racial supremacy. Thank you, Drew. That was a wonderful uh, introduction uh, to the problem. Uh, others on the panel who want to weigh in on some of the points that, that Drew made here at this point before we move on to another, another panelist? OK, that's not a problem. Uh, Michael, did you want to? No? Okay. Well, I, I, I just wanted to, to echo what was said. Um, uh, the, the impact has been, is clear and, and cannot be uh, undone. 
uh, and we know that we have to do something in order to change the outcomes and, and the focus on the process as opposed to the outcomes is, is devastating, but I will, I will continue. Thank you, Michael. Um, let me um, then move on to the, the next question, which I'll direct to uh, Johannes uh, Cleary. Um, and I'm gonna give you basically a, a twofold question. So I'm trying to see if you can work both things into your answer here. Uh, uh, you know, you have <clears throat> worked on multiple uh, amicus briefs in these uh, Supreme Court cases that the American Bar Association has filed. Uh, and we really appreciate the work that you have done and your team at Paul Weiss and the fact that you've stepped up to do this again uh, for us in these the new cases. Um, so I would ask uh, you a little bit about what it is that the ABA has argued or intends to argue in, in these cases as the American Bar Association. And while you're doing that, if you could um, address a particular aspect of this whole debate that comes up uh, from some of the more conservative justices, I'd appreciate it as well. And that is the argument that the, uh, the, the real victims of affirmative action are not the non-minority students who don't get into their number one pick, but it are in fact the minority students who end up in institutions uh, where they're underqualified and don't end up doing as well as they would have if they hadn't had the extra advantage in admissions. Um, if you can figure out how to answer both of those at the same time, you'll be, you'll be a good man, but, but go for it. Well, I'll do my best to answer both. I don't know, I'll do it at the same time. <laughs> Um, so uh, on the yeah, so that's right. So Paul Weiss has, um, uh, I, I guess, represented the ABA in filing amicus briefs in uh, the Fisher One and Fisher Two cases, which were decided in 2013 and 2016, and dealt with um, the um, admissions program at the University of Texas at Austin. And those are, of course, not the first time the ABA filed amicus briefs in. Um, Supreme Court cases dealing with affirmative action in higher education. The ABA also filed briefs in the Bakke and Kruder cases. Um, I wasn't able to work on those. I wasn't a lawyer yet. But um, at least in, in the Fisher one and Fisher two cases, I think the points that we made on behalf of the ABA, I think continue to be important ones. Um, and and uh, I wish I could say we've already written the brief, but we're still working on it. But I suspect um, you'll see similar themes, and I think Drew mentioned some of them. So essentially, the thrust of the ABA amicus briefs in the Fisher cases is that you know admissions policies at undergraduate institutions that consider race as one of a number of factors are important for achieving diversity in the legal profession because undergraduate institutions, of course, serve as pipelines into law schools and, and into the legal profession, and that in diversity in the legal profession, it, it serves a compelling uh, state interest. So uh, the briefs have emphasized a few points in particular. First, um, full representation of racial and ethnic minorities in the legal prof profession is in fact essential um, to the legitimacy of the legal profession and the le legitimacy of our legal and political institutions more generally. Um, you know, uh, maybe it's because I'm a lawyer, but lawyers play a central role in American legal and political institutions as advocates, judges, prosecutors, public officials, legislators, among other roles. One thing we noted in our brief in Fisher One was that over half of the nation's presidents have been lawyers. Um, and at, at the time, it's probably still true today, lawyers had long been the single largest occupation, op, occupational group in Congress. Um, and so consistent with that recognition, you know, we made the point that a diverse legal profession is essential for demonstrating that the path to leadership is open to all citizens, um, that the nation's laws are being made and administered for the benefit of all citizens, and that the justice system serves the public in a fair and inclusive manner. So, you know, one of the um, points that the Gruta court made is that um, in order to cultivate a set of leaders with legitimacy in the eyes of the citizenry, it is necessary that the path to leadership be visibly open to talented and qualified individuals of every race and ethnicity. And, and that's really something that we have emphasized in our brief. Um, we discussed, for example, data showing significant racial disparities in public perceptions about whether individuals of different races are treated fairly by the criminal justice system, for example. Um, 
And, and we, we made the related point that for a number of reasons, diversity in the legal profession improves the quality of legal services and judicial decisions. You know, it, it's not, you know, it's, it's, uh, we often hear um, judges and especially from diverse racial backgrounds and women justices talk about um, the role that their own personal perspectives play in how they um, make decisions. Justice Alito actually talked about this in, in his confirmation as a child of Italian immigrants. Um, the second point we made, and this is um, something that Drew talked about, is that although there's been substantial progress in terms of diversity in the legal profession, racial and ethnic minorities continue to be underrepresented. And this is, of course, against a backdrop of a country that is becoming, becoming increase, increasingly more racially and ethnically diverse. So we, um, taught, we reviewed a lot of the data showing minority representation lagging throughout the profession, including in private practice, like Drew said, particularly at the partner level of major law firms, but also in the judiciary, the federal and state judiciary, among prosecutors, among government lawyers, and in legal academia. Um, the third point we made um, is that diverse educational institutions are necessary for producing lawyers who in their various roles that I mentioned, again, judges, advocates, policymakers are less likely to be influenced by racial bias and stereotypes. So we looked at some of the emerging evidence that lawyers, like all members of society, frankly, are, are maybe influenced by implicit or unconscious racial bias and stereotypes, but that has a particularly significant impact when it comes to things like prosecutorial discretion juror selection um, um, in court. You know, the, the 2015 DOJ investigation of the Ferguson Police Department that, in Missouri, one of the things they identified is the ways in which municipal court practices often exacerbate potentially discriminatory police practices, for example, related to the issuance of arrest warrants or deciding which cases to dismiss. And then one, one final point I would say we've made in prior briefs that which may bear more emphasis this time around is, is the issue of stare decisis. Um, the Supreme Court precedent for decades now, include, starting with Baki, but including Grutter and the Fisher cases have made clear that the educational benefits that flow from a diverse student body are in fact, do in fact constitute a compelling state interest. And public and private instit educational institutions have relied on that precedent for decades in fashioning admissions programs. The, Harvard and UNC go through pains in their brief in their cert briefing and and in the and in the cases below to sort of document all the ways that their admissions programs have sort of made every effort to comply and be consistent with Supreme Court precedent. And one point we made in in the amicus briefs is that nothing that has happened in the decades since the Supreme Court has first articulated these principles, and certainly not in the few years since uh, Fisher II has been decided. Uh, of course, setting aside the current composition of the court that would justify overturning um, that, that precedent. Uh, and briefly on your second question about, you know, this argument that affirmative action may hurt minority students by putting them in educational settings where they can succeed, I guess I would have two reactions um, and maybe more if I thought about it longer. But one is, um, I'm not sure the empirical data support that argument, frankly. I mean, this came up in the Fisher cases, and there's probably been a lot more research since then. But I think the evidence of, of whether, for example, minority students admitted to selective schools with affirmative action programs do better or worse than their peers who attend less selective schools, it's at best mixed. And I think there's a fair amount of, of empirical data suggesting otherwise. And I think a lot of um, um, a, a lot of that, that, and I think the challenge is how do you measure all the ways in which um, being at a more selective school um, impacts someone's life and their long-term prospects. I mean, speaking personally as someone who has um, certainly been the product or beneficiary of affirmative action programs and attended so selective schools as an underrepresented minority, I think the, the, the effects it has on you personally and sort of the people around you, I mean, they're ripple effects and I'm not sure the, the empirical evidence really um, captures that. I think the second point I, was ma I would make is that even if you assume there is some merit to that concern, that's not a reason to prohibit schools from considering race altogether. Um, you know, nothing about affirmative action requires schools to admit students who are not otherwise qualified to attend. I think, the, I think from my perspective, it means that um, effective affirmative action programs don't end by just admitting um, underrepresented students. That's really the beginning. And if these programs are really gonna be effective, they have to make sure that students who are admitted to those schools have the 
appropriate academic and, uh, and other support, not just academic, to succeed both academically and socially. So it's not a reason to do away with affirmative action programs. It's a, it's a reason to do them uh, much better. Thanks for both of those answers, uh, you know, so I, I would only comment that in, in past cases, amicus briefs like the ABAs, but also uh, some others like one from, from Fortune 500 corporations, one from high, high military officers, about the need to have a pipeline that allows institutions of the, of the country to be visibly open has been persuasive. I'm hoping that those briefs are going to be filed by all those kinds of groups again this year, this time around. I imagine they will. Whether they will find as as a receptive an audience this time around is a, is a different question. But uh, I, I think your your response on this whole assumption that that people are that are plussed up or somehow going to end up doing less well in school seems completely right that there's plenty of people that Harvard can admit who could perfectly qualified to do the work they probably could admit 10 times as many people as they as they do and it's really a question of who gets to be uh, included in that lucky group and gets all those intangible benefits that you mentioned uh, great yeah I think that's right one of the striking statistics in the Harvard briefing is that even if the university admitted every student with a 4.0 GPA they'd have to quadruple the size of their class and not admit anyone without a 4.0 GPA. Yes. Yeah. Fascinating. Other comments from anybody? No? Um, Drew, you want to, you want to weigh in? You're, you're muted. Uh, yeah, I have uh, just a couple of things. I just, um, in support of your, your first um, point, um, you know, Justice O'Connor uh, has uh, noted years ago she said Justice Thurgood Marshall imparted not only his legal acumen, but also his life experiences, constantly pushing and prodding his colleagues to respond not only to the persuasiveness of legal argument, but also to the power of the moral truth. And Justice White basically uh, seconded that, saying that Marshall would tell us things that we knew but would rather forget. And he told us much that we did not know due to the limitations of our experience. Um, and the other thing that I did want to mention is there was this study that, I, that I'm sure many people are familiar with that the University of Michigan did comparing the success rates of the minority lawyers back to 1972, uh, most of whom had been admitted through uh, affirmative action, and white lawyers uh, that had graduated from Michigan. And they, they measured success on all kinds of, uh, it wasn't done by lawyers, it was done by people actually knew what they were doing, statisticians and so on. And, and uh, and it, uh, and it showed clearly no statistically significant difference between the two groups at all with respect to success when it came to money, to prestige, and so on, except for one thing. And that was that uh, the uh, people of color uh, were statistically more likely to engage in public service work outside of uh, their job. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, Al Franken, again, took a look at not so much uh, whether it does a disservice because of not being able to do the work to admit uh, people via affirmative action, which I think has been soundly refuted. But he also dealt with this. He said, now we're told that one of the poisonous and pernicious unintended consequences of affirmative action is that it taints the very real accomplishments of qualified Blacks who have earned their place at the table. But you know, he says, all the time when I was at Harvard, I never once heard a Lowell or a Cabot remark I dare say I despise this god awful legacy policy. It makes me feel so suspect in the eyes of my classmates. <laughs> <laughs> he had a way of he has a way of capturing things. <laughs> yes, uh, he does. Let's let's turn to uh, to John Yang. Um, John, you've been involved in the Harvard case in your in your professional capacity. Why don't you explain the role that you and your your organization? Uh, played in that case and, and more generally talk about how the plaintiffs there, their lawyers, uh, try to portray the a Asian applicants, Asian American applicants as the primary victims of the racial uh, preferences that Harvard employs. Absolutely, thank you, Paul. Thank you everyone for watching this seminar and a very important topic. First, in terms of what our organization is doing. So we are representing a group of Asian American individual students who support affirmative action, support holistic admissions policies, and supports the race-based admissions policies currently employed by Harvard. Because we and they believe 
that these policies actually benefit the Asian American community and benefit all of us with respect to ensuring that there is diversity on the school campus that they can learn from, and also to break down some of the stereotypes. Frankly, one of the things that oftentimes we hear is that the Asian Americans don't need affirmative action, and that's just not true. I mean, if you start to break down the statistics, there are definitely underrepresented groups, whether it is in the Southeast Asian American communities, whether it is in refugee communities that need race-based policies to help because they are, they are disproportionately underrepresented at Ivy League schools or schools in general. So first, with respect to why we're involved in this case is because we believe in race-based policies. Second is we looked at the evidence and the evidence says that there's no discrimination against Asian Americans. Now, let me assure you, if we saw that there was discrimination, then we would have been in line to sue the university and sue them against those policies. But the fact of the matter was there was a two week trial where the district court judge, district court judge took evidence that resulted in a 100 plus page opinion, which was affirmed by the First Circuit in another 100 or so page opinion, all of which meticulously went through that evidence and found that there was no d- discrimination against Asian Americans. So that's why we're involved in the way in which we are involved. So then the question becomes, OK, well, so if that's the case then why are there Asian Americans on the other side of the V, so to speak, that are, that are plaintiffs? And it is true that there are some Asian Americans that believe that affirmative action or race-based policies hurt their admissions process. Now, again, let's break down the statistics. Number one is in the entering class of Harvard, it's about approximately 25% Asian American. And this is against a backdrop in which the 2020 census tells us that 7% of the population is Asian American. So just statistically, it looks like there's a mismatch. But perhaps even more telling is what we might see as the motivation behind this lawsuit. So after the Fisher case, the Texas case, uh, was decided by the Supreme Court in supporting affirmative action or retaining affirmative action policies, Ed Blum, who is the person that created the plaintiff's group called Students for Fair Admissions, specifically said he needed an Asian plaintiff. Why did he say that? He said that because he understood that an Asian plaintiff might be seen as more sympathetic, it would cause potentially division within communities of color and cause a different conversation about affirmative action. So it wasn't about supporting or helping Asian Americans. It was about dismantling affirmative action and frankly, helping Caucasians. Because going back to the studies that we've talked about, if if you did not have race-based policies in the school admissions policy, uh, policy, at least at Harvard, we're talking about a very minimal effect on Asian Americans. The group that would benefit the most by about, I think, seven to 8% is Caucasians. And so that's really what's driving this this lawsuit. I think the last thing that I would want to say at at the outset is there's sometimes a misperception of where Asian Americans stand on this debate. We've done polling of this issue many, many times over several years. And all of our polling consistently demonstrates that Asian Americans support race-based policies. Typically about 70% of our communities support that. Because again, we recognize the benefits, we recognize what this brings to the community. So I think those are important starting points in recognizing what's going on, what's at stake and where Asian Americans stand. So John, let me just follow up question. The plaintiffs in the Harvard case are, have kind of put out this, this idea that they showed that there was the more subjective parts of the admissions process were the place where the admissions office tended to uh, discriminate against Asian American applicants. That they, that was where they, they didn't get listed as being particularly bubbly or friendly or interesting or whatever the subjective adjectives are that they use. Um, and uh, you actually wanted to uh, address that, right? At least I hope, I hope you would. Sure. I mean, first is, the, again, the district court looked at this evidence and found that that was not compelling, that, that the overwhelming weight of the evidence went the other way. But let's go more specific. And since this is an ABA panel, we can talk about the evidence a little bit. Basically, this was an expert that cherry picked the data. He compared emissions rates for Asian Americans in one specific segment from one year of admissions with Asian Americans from another year admissions to create this fiction that somehow Asian Americans were getting treated differently. And and frankly, I'm a little bit offended by the way in which they have done it. Now, I will say they've been successful in their media campaign to suggest 
that there was this evidence that Asian Americans were discriminated against with these subjective factors. But the way in which they have done it plays upon this so-called model minority stereotype. The Asian Americans are, have done really well in test scores and GPA, but it's because they lack leadership skills that they have been held back. And so he's playing upon that model minority fear that a number of Asian Americans have and that sort of the general populace sometimes buys into to promote this narrative that somehow we're being discriminated against. Whereas again, the evidence doesn't support it. And the district court clearly looked at it and said, that's not the case. It seems like uh, the, the focus on Asians also may have been motivated in part by the, uh, the, the goal of tying the current policies back to the 1930s uh, quotas on Jewish applicants and things that the most elite schools had uh, and, and get some mileage, at least PR mileage out of that as well. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, and certainly, again, there's a lot of misinformation, frankly, disinformation out there to suggest that what Harvard is engaging in is quotas. And so they hearken back to the 1930s policies uh, that discriminate against Jewish Americans. Yeah. We all agree that quotas are illegal. We all have looked at sort of the district court opinion uh, and looked at this evidence, and that's just not the case. Right. So let's let's turn it, go next to, to Michael Lawson. Um, you're from LA, you're uh, head of the Urban League out there, uh, and as uh, Drew uh, previewed, I think, uh, it would be useful to hear from you about what happens when affirmative action in higher education admissions goes away, as it has done in California now for a quarter century after uh, Prop 209. What, what does that tell us about what the country is going to look like and what the entire educational system of the country is going to look like? Uh, if the Supreme Court changes course and requires race-blind admissions uh, in, the, in the current cases? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, uh, the short answer is that it is going to have a negative impact. There's no question about it. Um, the, the reason for affirmative action was because the system was, uh, we had a race-based system in the first place. Uh, and the race-based system begins at uh, the elementary school level. Uh, and uh, the, the, it moves forward and is impacted at every level. And you end up with the, 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 the population that you were hoping to get because you, uh, uh, you made sure that this group of people had uh, the, the smallest uh, access to to the educational tools that are necessary to move forward. Now, the one institution that has done it just the opposite way, except at the top, it's the sporting industry in, in the United States. Somehow, some way, you find uh, uh, African Americans and, and other minorities at the top of their game in, in all of these sporting activities. And why is that? Because it begins early and because the, the recruitment is early. And, and so part of the problem that we have here is that we're starting with the affirmative action issue at the top, at, at the college level, when in fact we need to be stretching out and making sure that the access to, um, to, to the tools that are necessary to, to become successful in this country are at every single level. So at the Los Angeles Urban League, we are focused on, on, on the elementary, middle school, high school, the, the, the pipelines that, that, that uh, enable the colleges to do the recruitment that they, they should be able to do. And again, the colleges are very good at recruiting Black uh, uh, athletes. They're, they don't put as much time and effort and energy into recruiting the academician, academic part of the equation. Uh, the talents are there. The, 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 the tools necessary to move our country forward in an egalitarian way is there. But in the absence of a, 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 a process that forces the institutions at the top to look at the people within this country who have not been 
who have not a, had access to these various tools, we're not going to make any progress. And so uh, there are efforts at, at different institutions based on the leadership of those particular institutions who are doing uh, uh, well in their particular space. But overall, no, there has been an impact. There has been a negative impact. And the, the um, percentage of people of color in the University of California system has been negatively impact for sure? No question about it. No question yeah. about it. Um, I have a follow-up question, but um, before I ask that, why don't we, uh, I want to just urge people to put some questions in the Q&A. We have one good one there, but we could definitely use some more audience uh, suggestions as well about where, where this conversation should go. Um, and I guess uh, the question I would ask um, you, Michael, and others may, have a, may want to weigh in on this as well, is why can't this problem be solved simply by looking at proxies like socioeconomic deprivation? What's the uh, uh, reason why we have to give uh, a, a plus to people based on their racial group, including people who didn't experience socioeconomic deprivation? Candidly, it's a racial issue. Um, I, I am a, a, a retired lawyer. Uh, At least you didn't and- say recovering. We don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Retired, recovering, and and and, uh, and part of that group that came out of Harvard Law School in 1978, after Harvard had uh, significantly increased the number of uh, African Americans in their class, and we had an amazing class. Um, uh, we all, as you mentioned earlier, in in addition to the work that we were doing, we were uh, focused on the issues that affected uh, other people in our community. And a lot of us spent a lot of time working on the, the, the creating the diversity that we knew was necessary in the law firms that we worked in. And uh, I have, I'm happy to say that I was very effective uh, at uh, at, at, at the law firm that I was in, Skadden Arts. But it was a lot of work. It was, it was not a situation where you flip the switch, the switch and you, you, you look at the numbers and, you, and, and the, the, the results that you want automatically happen. It's work at every level, even if you have a situation where you consciously are looking to recruit and promote people of color, there is a barrier that is systemic that we as a country have to face and change, but it is not going to change simply because somebody passes a statute. There's a lot of work to do. Others want to weigh in on this question of alternative uh, kind of proxies that could be used? If I might, I, I yes, there are proxies that can be used, but I wouldn't call them proxies. They're, when we're talking about emissions, we should be talking about a holistic emissions policy that every single factor is considered. And I'll be very personal about this. Basically, what the plaintiffs want in this case is for race not to be considered, this notion of race blindness. I don't know how I could tell my story as an individual without talking about my race and what it meant to be Chinese American growing up. And that's what these people are asking us to do. You know, this notion that equal protection of race equals race blindness is just a false statement. You know, yes, we should protect people equally, but part of that consideration of race and being able to tell who we are and how we, how we grew up, how, what made us who we are. I completely agree with that, John. I mean, I was thinking about this. I, I don't know how I don't know how far you take it, right? Like, so if if I was in law school, I was the president of the Black Law Students Association. Do I need to take that off my resume because it signals race? I mean, what about names? I mean, this is the whole thing. What 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 we learn from a lot of the implicit bias literature that people people identify racially identify people in so many ways beyond just having you know, 
the, a, a box that's checked that says African American or whatever based on people's names, their affiliation. So how far do you go if you're insisting that schools can't take race into account in the admissions process? And, and I completely agree with Michael. I mean, as long as race still impacts the experience of people in America, which I don't know how after the last couple of years you can deny that, um, <laughs> I think it still should be a permissible one of many factors that schools can take into account in shaping their student student body. And and you know, as, as a uh, woman, there's no question that I was an affirmative action admit to Yale Law School in 1968, as were a great many women. It was the first year that women started to go to law school, and big numbers were finally admitted. That to the extent there was a quota system, it was a white male quota, uh, and but the Vietnam War came along and suddenly in 1968, for the first time, men could not get deferments from the draft and from the war because of entering graduate school. So all of a sudden, women became deeply popular in schools that hitherto had uh, rejected them because they were women. Uh, so I am a, as Barbara Babcock put it, you know, I am for affirmative action as a proud beneficiary of affirmative action. And I think that, uh, as many uh, you know, women of color uh, who face barriers uh, on both grounds uh, very much uh, have experiences that are quite different from those of any of us on this uh, who are speaking right now on this particular uh, uh, panel. And just on the question of proxies, you know, as as the the people who have litigated these cases know much more than I, these lengthy decisions that were um, alluded to. Uh, have page after page of examination of the claim that there are proxies, uh, for example, socioeconomic status and so on, and, and exactly why they don't work. And I, when I was uh, running the Bar Association in San Francisco, Proposition 209 was passed, and we were thinking, trying to think of every proxy we could think of that was race neutral. And so one of them was, uh, and UCLA Law School tried this, uh, language other than English spoken in the home. Well, it turned out that they ended up with uh, quite a few uh, Jewish immigrants from Russia uh, rather than uh, uh, underrepresented uh, people of color. So, it, but if you, you have but to read those opinions to see a very detailed um, analysis of why there really is not a single or a group of uh, proxies that will, will make for the kinds of admissions of people of color that uh, that have been created by, by affirmative action. There's certainly been many studies that have all come to the same conclusion that the selective schools could not achieve anything like the kind of racial diversity they're striving for, for their educational mission. If they were, were looked just at people who came from socioeconomic deprivation and, and or other products, it's just not possible. And so, you know, I think when you go into these these cases, that, that ought to be almost a given. And then the question is, well, is that a right or not? You know, and, and it, that is the question that the court will eventually answer, whether they'll be making us uh, tolerate a world that is less open than the one that we've been living in for 43 years. Um, but I guess I would raise a, a related question, which is there are some people who are people of color who've gone through elite institutions who come out with a kind of sense that they're credentials or their credibility is questioned because they're perceived as having been beneficiaries of affirmative action, or at least, you know, I have the sense that there, there are such people out there. Does anybody have a comment on that or uh, think that that's something that is, is a real phenomenon or not a real phenomenon? It's a real phenomenon. It's a real phenomenon. Um, you have to prove yourself every single day. Uh, there's an assumption that uh, you are there just to, to check a box. Um, and uh, uh, it's, um, the, 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 the fact is we understand that. The fact is uh, uh, in, in, in my recruitment days, uh, I would be uh, very clear to the people that I was recruiting. You have to be the best in your group, period. You know, uh, being adequate is not good enough. You have to, to excel in whatever venue you're in in order to be considered, considered equal. Uh, 
and uh, and and that is what uh, I train the people that I mentored to be. Uh, run fast, do jump higher. Uh, because there is an assumption that you are just a token. But there's a broader assumption also in the general society, a, pre a presumption essentially of, of incompetence. And I think that that feeling is not what a feeling that somebody walks into the university with it because of the way they are treated by the white students. Uh, uh, and uh, I, you know, it's often been said the joke that, you know, when a white person, when a white man fails, they don't say, hey, you know, we can't hire any more white men anymore. <laughs> uh, but uh, but you have to overcome that presumption of incompetence and women uh, do, do that to a lesser extent every single time. So on the subject of alternatives, um, we had a lot of discussion in the Fisher case of ways in which the University of Texas had in fact had to change its method of admissions um, when it was subject to an injunction from the Fifth Circuit to, uh, to stop considering race. And they went to the so-called 10% uh, rule where the, they would admit it, everybody who was in the top 10% of a graduating class at a high school in the state of Texas. Uh, and I, I guess the, the uh, question I, I would ask the group is, are there, are there ways in which uh, if maybe not Harvard, but the University of North Carolina could achieve, uh, maintain its level of diversity without race, race by using something like that, a, a, a device which works because there's such residential segregation in this country that the top 10% in many high schools will be uh, different people of color than other places, et cetera. Um, thoughts about that? Well, certainly the University of Texas found that it did not produce enough diversity to make the need for affirmative action go away. In fact, the second, the Fisher case, one of the two Fisher cases dealt with this hybrid system of the 10% plus uh, a system uh, superimposed on that of traditional um, affirmative action. And it does, of course, uh, rely on uh, uh, racial, not just, you know, racial segregation in housing and so on, but that uh, that the people of color who are segregated into these uh, non-white schools receive far fewer resources, far fewer AP courses, far fewer opportunities to, uh, to actually gain the kind of education that they need in order to, uh, to excel and get into these colleges. A big part of the conversation, Fisher, was um, what does it mean to achieve a sufficient level of diversity for your educational uh, goals, and does it have? Does every class have to be diverse, or is it? Does every major have to be diverse, or how do you look at those issues? Uh, and what is a so-called critical mass of diversity? And it seems to be a fixation of the conservative justices to say, I, I don't even know what, what it is that you're trying to achieve. So I can, how am I supposed to judge when you've gotten there? Uh, this this so-called compelling interest in a, a critical mass of sufficient people on campus and does it matter where they're distributed, et cetera. So thoughts about any of that? You think that's just a red herring? Oh, I don't think so at all, but I'll leave that to um, my fellow panelists. Yeah, I think catch 22 may, I think it's uh, in some ways it's a catch 22 because the, the you know, the, the question that, as you said, that was raised, um, in Fisher II, for example, by Alito and his dissent is, you know, I, I don't, if your goal is supposed to be um, narrowly tailored, um, you know, how can I decide whether you've met it if I don't know, um, if I don't know what the, what the, what the, what the mark is, what, what we're aiming toward. And so, you know, this, in these decisions is often talk about, you know, the, the population is not representative. Well, representative of what? Um, the, the problem is, as soon as you put a number on the table, then it starts to sound a lot like a quota, <laughs> which is which is um, which is unconstitutional. And so that's why I think, in some ways, it's a catch twenty two. But I think it's also part of the reason um, why where the court landed in 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 Grutter is you kind of, on some level, do have to defer to the judgment of the of the institution. Um, and you know, I, I think in both in, in the record in both Harvard and the UNC cases.
you know, there's a robust effort to sort of articulate what we're working toward and, um, and, and also, um, you know, um, assess how we're doing on that score using both quantitative and qualitative evidence. And I think that's, that's what, you know, someone like Alito is going to be focused on. You know, what, 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 what is the precise articulation of the goals and, you know, what are the metrics that are help that I can use to measure whether or not the universities are getting there and how much progress they're making to get there. Right. In order for me to accept the proposition that, that socioeconomic diversity is not going to be a good enough uh, alternative basis, you need to know how far, how diverse it has to be to, to be a, a successful program. But anyway, John? I also think that some of these types of arguments that are made start to miss the point. Uh, the point here that they're trying to make is that somehow a lot of decisions are being made based on race. And again, that's not how holistic admissions works. Yes, race is a factor, but frankly, it's a very small factor. As Drew said, legacies, sports uh, athletes, the so-called dean's list or president's list, where sort of your special skills, whether it's a skill as an actor, or whether it's a skill as a son or daughter of a politician or anything along those lines, puts you in that special category where you get significant markups or significant points as well. So let's also ground ourselves in how these admissions policies work, because it is. I mean, the, the, the problem is people start to get into this scarcity mentality of, OK, there's only a limited number of slots. And where does my son or daughter fit? And we have to have a broader conversation about education and how Harvard, Yale, nothing against those schools or Ivy League schools. You know, that should not be the be all and end all for everyone. We, we have a broader discussion about how we create more equity in the system rather than just focusing on how do you get more kids of the kind that you want into these particular schools. You know, you're touching on the uh, sports thing. Uh, people tend to, in a racial way, say, oh, well, the sports, uh, the sports thing, you know, that, uh, that is a uh, preference that, that uh, helps people of color. But in, uh, this is not the case. We are talking, you know, lacrosse and rowing. And you have but to look at the varsity blues scandal last year. These were not people of color who were paying a whole lot of money to have their kids fake up uh, academic prowess. And it is a huge, huge, I didn't realize this at all until I got involved in all this. Uh, it is a huge preference. And, uh, and when they, you know, in uh, under Bush one, H.W. Uh, uh, Bush, under his, there was an administrative complaint filed about the uh, minority, the, the uh, preference for, uh, alumni and and it was filed by Asian parents actually he said it discriminates against minorities and they said it, it certainly does but what was so interesting that it was you know it was justified by a compelling interest you know money but they did do a lot of statistical analysis and they found that the legacy admits at the schools where I think were Harvard and Yale maybe Princeton or something the legacy admits this huge number of legacy admits had stats that were substantially lower than the uh, other non-preference people who were admitted. Uh, and about those of uh, the sports uh, uh, admits, which it turns out was just a huge preference. Uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, the idea that somehow these uh, legacy admits are, you know, if you're the, the son or daughter of a, of a Harvard then you must be very special indeed. Well, no. You know, there are, there's going to be an enormous uh, pressure put on the institutions if the court does overrule uh, Grutter, as plaintiffs are asking, for these other preferences, because they're going to be so highlighted in the, in the public mind is how can you have an institution where they're favoring this group of largely white privileged people uh, and they, they're not allowed to uh, take into account racial diversity anymore. Uh, you know, I, Drew mentioned earlier on that uh, Amherst had gotten rid of uh, legacy uh, preferences, and uh, I, I'm on the board there. Uh, the, the prospect that we might be facing this potential decision certainly was not irrelevant to the decision to address that issue now. Uh, I think we would have done it either way, but uh, it is, it, it, there's going to be almost impossible to imagine a world in which we have things like legacy, maybe even athletics, but certainly legacy admissions without affirmative action being permitted uh, at the elite institutions, I would think. Oh, okay. Well, can I just throw in one other thing on the question of how much is enough? Uh, 
um, when we used to do a lot of programs for general counsel and um, managing partner types at the bar in the late eighties and early nineties, it came back and we invited a lot of uh, partners. They were never the managing partners, partners of color and associates of color to these things. Uh, and it turned out that, uh, and I guess this is definitely in the literature that white people's idea of what is in fact uh, truly integrated, uh, say student body or uh, employment situation is very different from that of people of color. Uh, if you just have a handful of, uh, of people of uh, uh, color, uh, that's kind of enough for an awful lot of, uh, of white people. And it is not enough for those people to feel comfortable in, uh, uh, in doing their thing wherever it is that, that the venue is. I think I will start asking some of the audience questions, which I think will be a nice transition from some of the themes we've been talking about. And thanks, thanks to this panel for this great discussion so far. Um, the first one from an anonymous attendee is uh, more about alternatives um, to considering race directly. Uh, question says, if race can't be taken into account, could schools take into account other factors like tribal affiliation, descendants of the formerly enslaved in America, descendants of those who lived in Jim Crow America, descendants of those who were put in internment camps in the US, et cetera. What's the answer to that? Uh, let me, I can start. I, I think schools already do to a certain extent look at all of these factors when they're looking at personal essays and the like. But again, it goes down to, can I rewrite my essay to talk about my immigrant experiences as opposed to being Chinese American, I suppose, but then am I being forced to be not as authentic of a person to myself by doing that? Yes. And so again, what are we trying to teach our kids when they're going through this admissions process by saying, you can't talk about something that is central to who you are. And one of the questions that I saw in the chat they refer to so how do we put the, the context of Ahmaud Arbery killings, the, the, the murder of Dante Wright and, and all, all of these murders into this? And I think that's an important point because even for someone that is not socioeconomically deprived, who is African-American, and I shouldn't speak on that. I think Johannes and Michael really should speak on this, but I, those murders, or maybe I talk about the Atlanta murders, have an effect on who I am and the community I am part of even if I have social economic advantages. So we have to talk about this directly if we're really going to address these issues. The other point I would make is if you, if you have a, a criterion which is 100% correlated with race and, it, and race has been held illegal, it's probably just getting it thrown out as a, as, a, uh, as a workaround that doesn't work. But, but I mean, to your broader point that uh, people ought to be able to talk about their personal experience with all of its fullness and that, that racial identity is always going to be a part of that is, is, is a really valid one. And it also raises sort of the, 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 the other side of the coin, which is what kind of, if, if, if the admissions officers are still doing a holistic process, what does it mean to tell them not to take into account a person's race? I mean, when they're looking at this admissions file, and you know, a person is a Latino heritage from a particular part of LA where there's a, a lot of poverty and has still achieved great things. You, you can't not notice that, right? <laughs> uh, so how does, it just strikes me that there will be in a post grutter world, if we ever get there, a great deal of kind of informal consideration of of everything, just as long as there's a holistic process, you can't not. Well, what about interviews? I mean, most uh, most uh, colleges uh, do interviews. Uh, uh, how are you supposed to uh, interview someone without uh, seeing uh, who they are? And the other the other side of that coin is that what you mentioned earlier, uh, if the uh, Access to the, the 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 education, access to um, to to uh, the, the the elite schools, access to um, all of the various things that get you to the point where you feel that you can apply to these schools are affected by race. 
how do you ignore that? And, and understand that, that part of it is that, that, that even people who don't think that they're uh, using that lens also use it. If you give me 30 seconds, I was head of the um, diversity committee when I was at, at SCAD and we had a, a uh, three-day session where we just talked about these issues. And uh, we had a professor from Harvard Law School come in and talk to us for those three days. And we had a, some deep and uh, uh, very, I, th I think, effective conversations. And at the end, uh, one of my partners came over to me and said, this has been a great session. Uh, and I'm proud of myself that I, I, I make all of my hiring decisions based on you know, merit and not about race whatsoever. And I had to uh, remind him that everybody that in his department looked just like him. He did not have a diverse group of white guys in his group. <laughs> And so there are biases that we all have that if we are focused on trying to, to eliminate those biases from our decision-making process, we end up doing the same thing over and over again, which is the definition of insanity, I believe. I was talking to the managing partner of a uh, huge, very prestigious law firm here in San Francisco and uh, asked him, uh, we were talking about implicit bias versus explicit bias, uh, but mostly about implicit bias and about all the training. And I said, well, do you do implicit bias training at your firm and he, uh, in order to get at these, at these theoretically unconscious uh, kinds of things? And he said, oh yeah, he says, we do some of it. I said, do you think it really does any good with the with uh, the majority of your white male colleagues, and he said, "Well, maybe a little at the edges." And then he said, "You know, we don't really have to worry that much about implicit bias here at the firm." He said, "Because we have so much explicit bias here at the firm, which is <laughs> unfortunately, I can't speak for Scadden, but too true." So, question number two: um, How would you respond? panelists to the assertion that affirmative action benefits white women more than any other group. What? <laughs> well, I think the, uh, that may have been true. In, in the early the days, time. in yeah. the early days, uh, there was no question that there was a uh, tremendous discrimination against, um, women in uh, education, as we all know. Um, at, at this point, I think most, at least when we're talking education, I think most affirmative action is very much aimed at people of color because, um, because such a huge number of uh, white women come uh, from exactly the same backgrounds as the white men that have traditionally been admitted. I think the real focus, you know, I think has to be on, on women of color if you're talking about women, uh, and, that, and there was this one statistic that over the last 11 years, the percentage of women of color who are equity partners increased by one-tenth of one uh, percent. Um, so I, I don't think that that's uh, true in education. It may be true uh, much more in employment where the white men who do make these decisions, they're more comfortable with somebody who lives out there in the suburbs with them. Uh, if they must hire a woman than they are uh, uh, or hire someone who is diverse uh, uh, than they are with hiring uh, a person of color. Um, so that, that I, I think uh, there is something to that. The, the, the reality now in terms of college admissions, as I understand it, is that the number of men applying is continuously going down relative to the number of women and that in, in many uh, schools they have uh, they're sort of trying to get their number of men up that just for all sorts of cultural reasons they have tons of high quality women applicants at a lot of schools and so I don't there may have been a time obviously there was a time when schools were making an affirmative effort to bring more women and in, in sort of the law schools needed to <laughs> desperately uh, but uh, that that's going to be historical not to um, 
The, the next question is, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what they're getting at, but let me try to interpret it. Asking somebody on the panel to make the opposing argument that affirmative action uh, is bad because it just perpetuates making decisions based on race and, and, and continuation of racism. This is the John Roberts position, the way to stop uh, discriminating based on race is to stop discriminating based on race. I guess maybe I would flip around it, uh, just Chief Justice Roberts statement as uh, I'll stop considering race when people stop, stop being racist. <laughs> I, uh, because the reality is we still have institutional racism. The reality is we still have explicit and implicit bias that is resulting in racism towards communities of color, especially African-Americans and Latino Americans. So then the reality is we should be considering race to address all of that. Would we love to get to a multicultural society uh, where people aren't considering race? Yes. And if we do that, then yes, race should not be considered in the same way. But until we get there, we have to be considering race. I think this gets at the, you know, the point you made earlier, John, which is that um, it, it sort of assumes that institu institutions are making decisions based solely on race, which is not really what, what the proposal is. It's, it's race as one factor among, I mean, and if you look at these programs, it's, I mean, in, in, in Fisher, the, 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 the phrase was a factor of a factor of a factor. I mean, it's, one, it's just, you're just saying, let's look at the whole person and, and take race into account, take, take account of race for what it is. Um, it's not making decisions based solely or even principally on race. There's another good quote. I mean, I, you know, I collect quotes because uh, they say it better than I could, but the, the speech writer under uh, the first Bush president, Michael Gerson, uh, said something that I think addresses what was said earlier. He said, I'm a conservative who believes systemic racism is real citing his own upbringing in St. Louis in a suburb. None of this was neutral or normal. Responsibility is not guilt. White people do have a responsibility as citizens and as moral creatures to seek a society where equal opportunity is a reality for all. What is equal opportunity but a cruel joke to a significant portion of the country? Shouldn't that create an outrage and urgency that we rarely see and even more rarely feel? We have a question from Richard Fulton, um, which is, involves the a reference to the current invocation of equity as a concept and how that fits into the framework of uh, allowable for affirmative action versus impermissible quotas. Is there, uh, is, it, is there a risk that actions taken in the name of equity, equity will be, end up being deemed as a, as a quota? And I guess that raises the the broader question of whether or not there really is a clear distinction between holistic admissions and quotas. Are there, those on the other side of this debate would say, you know, you end up functionally doing the same thing. You know, you sort of have an idea how far, how many of each group you want in the school, et cetera. But any comments on, on Richard's question? Yeah, it's. I don't it's quite a, understand. Yeah, I'm not sure I do. We'll try. We'll try the next one. Uh, I, there's a question I, here. It, it assumes, though, a level sort of a, that kind of question in a way. Although I don't think this particular individual feels this way. Sort of assumes kind of a level playing field. I think, uh, which is a fallacy. Mm -hmm. So there's a question here about the, the current controversy involving um, uh, ABA CLE courses and the requirement of diversity in the uh, speakers at CLE courses that led the Florida uh, bar to prevent people from using ABA CLE. Does anybody uh, know, know about this controversy? The, the question is what the ABA is doing about that. Well, the ABA is um, uh, in the uh, process of, uh, of writing, uh, of, of taking a position that uh, is against what the Supreme Court did while somehow trying to get Florida lawyers to be able to get credit for ABA uh, uh, CLE courses. And uh, I think at the outset, it was, a, in my view, uh, the original suggested one was pretty weak. 
but it's being worked on by uh, people of good faith uh, to toughen it up uh, while at the same time trying to uh, massage it enough to get uh, the, the credit for these uh, lawyers. I'm not sure that that's uh, possible, but that's what they're that's what they're trying to do. Obviously, the ABA disagrees, and that and the policy in question, the ABA policy, really was as a result of the fact that that the panels on CLE courses, not just by the ABA, but in general by professional groups, are overwhelmingly uh, featuring white males, and it is not just. Uh, that you want to hear from the, the perspectives of uh, a diverse group that you don't necessarily get without some conscious uh, tinkering, but also uh, the, the perception uh, by people uh, looking at this group that, uh, that this is something that has something to do with me. Thank you, Drew. I knew you'd be informed on this subject as you are on all okay. subjects. Um, there's a there's a there's a predictive question which I think we were going to get to eventually. Um, can you speak to the prospects for a Supreme Court ruling that overturns affirmative action? Where are the justices on this? Anybody want to take a flyer on that one? Well, Paul, you're the Supreme Court litigator. Yeah, you probably can answer that better than any of us. I already used the I already used the code words. I said there's lots of concern among people who support affirmative action that the court might do that. <laughs> <laughs> might overturn it. I mean, it is really, I think, hard to count to, uh, to five justices without Justice Kennedy there anymore, uh, without Justice Ginsburg there anymore. Um, but it, it, the truth of the matter is we haven't heard from uh, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett on this subject. And they do surprise one. You know, the, uh, the case that I would point to is for those who want to hold out the, the notion that it's not 100% certain is the Bostock case from June of 2020, in which Justice Gorsuch joined by Chief Justice Roberts and uh, the liberal members of the court held that Title VII prohibits discrimination against LGBTQ people because it prohibits discrimination based on sex and that the two are inseparable. And this was, I think, really quite a remarkable extension of anti-discrimination protections to a group that is, didn't think it necessarily had majority support in the court at the time, but it did, it turned out. So, you know, there, there may be, this has happened to before. Uh, Justice Kennedy changed his perspective after thinking about it over a period of years uh, from a more of an opponent to, to more of a supporter. Uh, so it's, it's conceivable that something might be cobbled together that the Chief Justice might somehow decide this is not the time to do this. I don't know. Uh, others have a thought about this? I think someone alluded to this before. One of the issues for me is how much do they feel like precedent matters? You know, we have had 40 plus years of precedent supporting race-based holistic admissions policies. Are they willing to overturn that now? Well, and is this the kind of thing where there's a reliance interest that is sufficiently strong? I know that you hope exactly. it's a great, a great brief, but... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then the second thing for me is in this particular case, we have ample evidence supporting the fact that Harvard did not, and, and for the UNC case, we haven't talked as much about the UNC case. I'm not as familiar with that, but both cases had very lengthy factual findings of non-discrimination. So how much does that matter in their thinking and how they would craft an opinion? Well, and, and you know, the idea that, uh, that the people sitting on that court, you know, like most many Americans, may well believe that uh, they got where they got to on merit alone, which is, of course, ridiculous. You know, most of them uh, entered the gravy train very early in life and were carried on. And they, they if they fell off it, they were pushed right back on again. Uh, so and Justice Thomas, of course, clearly, uh, like me, was an affirmative action admit to Yale Law School. He was there the same time I was near the end of it. Uh, and the to me, the it. it it would be great if uh, our justices really looked into themselves and and looked at their own trajectory to see whether or not uh, uh, this was uh, merit alone. Yeah, I think I think Justice Thomas might be your toughest audience in that respect. I mean, he's outright <laughs> said he uh, <laughs> thinks you know Gruder was wrongly decided. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> I know.
Got an interesting question here uh, of, uh, well, there's sort of a bottom line question, which is if the court does strike down affirmative action, as some think it probably will, what do we do going forward? What's this? One of the things I think that's interesting about this whole thing is that, um, you know, pretty much every, insti every education institution has said this is important. <laughs> um, and, and, it's, and as you said, it's not just education institutions, it's employers. And so, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens when, if, if, you know, five or six justices <laughs> decide to overturn this precedent, do universities stop doing it? Do they find some other way of doing it? I mean, in some ways you, 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 you like having a regime where they have to sort of document and justify how they're considering race, why they're considering race um, and, and sort of measuring progress towards some defined goal. Um, in some ways we could be worse off if, um, if we end up in a regime where there's, you know, it's, you know, legally prohibited, but, you know, folks are kind of just <laughs> settling for some proxy without any kind of um, light shining on it to figure out exactly how and, and why. Well, clearly the whole question of proxies is going to be uh, closely examined again. Are there ways that get by some draconian opinion if it does ha happen that way, which I very much hope it doesn't, uh, that allow uh, racial diversity to uh, continue to uh, exist in, um, in higher education. Um, so I think things like uh, interviews, I think things um, uh, like language-based things, things, uh, I mean, various things that haven't worked very well up till now. I mean, I think uh, the uh, ever fertile mind of man and woman will, will be applied here uh, to try to um, get the people that you want to and have to include in higher education into higher education. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, it's, it will be a very difficult problem for the institutions to address at that point and try to figure out how to continue to, to be as good as the institutions as they are now. Uh, and, what, to what extent do they operate through some sort of a, a wink and nod system or, or, or what are there real proxies they can use? It'll, it'll, be a very it'll be very challenging to be an admissions officer at one of these institutions for sure if this happens. Well, and I think Amherst was prescient in knowing that also if this comes down the wrong way, I think there are going to be lawsuits brought by people of color in connection with the uh, alumni preference, which is clearly discriminatory. Yeah. Um, there's a question here, are, is setting goals and times tables still acceptable? I guess uh, maybe this is, ought to be translated. If um, you don't consider race at the individual level, is it still okay to have in, in a post uh, grutter world uh, aspirational goals for the institution to have a certain degree of uh, diversity? I would think so if it doesn't change your decision-making processes. But. This question made me think of, you know, you have to, uh, O'Connor's, the line in Grutter that like, you know, the expectation that in 25 years, racial preferences will no longer be necessary. And of course it hasn't yet been 25 years, which again gets to the start of the size. Getting there though. <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, we, I think it's also pretty clear that she was wrong. <laughs> um, that, you know, progress on these issues are slow and not linear. Um, and, you know, I, unfortunately, I think we, we, I, I think we all kind of talked about, it. we still live in a society where race very much impacts um, people's lived experience. And we're just not in that world yet. Well, and to the yeah. extent the Supreme Court has upheld um, anti-affirmative action initiatives like the Draconian 209 in uh, California, but also in many other states, uh, there's no question that after 1990s, you know, the, the number of minorities in um, in law schools tripled between 1972 and 1996. And then all of a sudden, wham you saw a complete flattening for Mexican-Americans and for Blacks for the next many, many, many years. 
and they started to creep up, but remain quite low. Uh, and so when I was running the bar in the 80s and early 90s, the pipeline really was changing. You know, we used goals and timetables with law firms and the corporate law departments. We sponsored scholarships for um, uh, people of color and so on. And, so, and, 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 and it was beginning to have an impact, which is precisely why they, they went for Proposition 209, because we were succeeding. That's my theory, cynic that I may be. Yeah, I mean, there's a question here about how do institutions lead the conversation so that people really understand these points? I mean, it sort of brings to mind for me, where do you think the American people are on this issue? If you, you, John talked about the, the views of the Asian American community, but what about the American people overall now? Would they, would they pass a Prop 209 at the national level if you could do national referenda? Anybody have a, have a, a sense of that? It depends on how it's um, fashioned. And I'll yield to you, sir. This country has a long way to go. Yeah. A very long way to go. And it's retrenched um, somewhat recently. <laughs> um, I, would, I would not use the term retrenched as much as I would use the term uh, there's an ask, there's a portion of our community that felt emboldened under the Trump era and is 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 speaking very plainly uh, in the light what they have been saying for a long time in the darkness. Jim Crow is still here. Uh, the number of people who would openly uh, discriminate against uh, pick a category are still around. And the question is, do we push back or not? Because they are continuing to push and push forward. And we, we, if we want to live up to the ideals that are incorporated in our constitution, there is still much work to be done. Oh, sorry <laughs> to disagree with that. I was just going to yeah. say, people forget that when Proposition 209 was first uh, passed uh, in California, it was pretty close, and it was it was falsely dubbed by in a totally clever, uh, dishonest way by the proponents as the California Civil Rights Initiative, and and so I think that again, it depends on how it's posed. Uh, and it is, in, and and you know, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund under John Payton when he was running it, they went after a number of, and people here know a lot more about this than I do. But when I talked to him once about it, they went after uh, a lot of these propositions in states that it turned out that the signatures were false. They managed to stop several of them, even though there was a sense of inevitability. So I think that. You're correct. We have to really fight against the sense of inevitability and realize that uh, we have to we have to uh, get the people who who do not believe in racism and hope to work on themselves uh, to fight. One more question, perhaps we can squeeze in here. We have a question about. Um... Uh, the, the, the premise of the question is that race, racist policies and abuses are enabled by apathy of, of many. What's the best way to counter the as long as I've got mine, I don't care mentality, which allows much of this uh, to continue? It's really about, again, about how to win the hearts and minds of the significant majority of the American people to the idea that we need to maintain the, the, the systems of diversity and equity that we've been talking about. How do we do that? We all do, we all work on it every day, I guess. That's the best what we have to do. Uh, this is not a, uh, and it's a long fight, uh, but uh, this panel has contributed, I think, really well to the uh, uh, making these arguments in a, in a very positive and uh, uh, convincing way. Uh, and so I want to say thank you. I'm going to cut things off here about four minutes early, if that's all right. Uh, thank you for joining us in this webinar. To everyone in the audience, thanks for the great questions. I want to thank this esteemed group of panelists. Uh, you're all doing such critical work and keep it, keep it up the good work. 
And again, the section of civil rights and social justice provides free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. We hope you'll take advantage. Come back and see us at another event. Uh, and uh, best of luck uh, in your work and stay safe, everybody. Uh, and with that, I will